Hello, Money Multipliers. Welcome back to another episode of the Money Multiplier Podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Kessler, and we ask ourselves, do our dollars make sense? So in today's episode, I am joined by the infamous Larry Steinhouse here again. So I know I had him on one of my past episodes, but uh, he is really labeled the crazy real estate investor. So Larry, how are you doing today? I'm crazy. <laughs> Especially on this Friday, right? Oh, this so yeah. So, so you know, you're over there in Florida. We're what? It's like 70 degrees or something? Today it is it's warming back up. Yeah. Right now it's 24 degrees and snowing again. Again. Yeah. I want to go to Florida. Why am I here? I mean, you can move down. You have any you have an extra bedroom for me? I do. So actually right. my my guests will see this too because I'm getting my podcast studio all up and running. So um I'm actually talking to y'all from my new kitchen today. But I was gonna, I was gonna say your podcast studio looks like a really nice kitchen. It's a really cool looking podcast studio. Is that a green screen? It might be a green screen. So I'm getting all no. that set up. I'm excited about it. You have to excuse me. I have a terrible cold. So I'm I'm not even cold. I'm just a terrible cough for a week now. You know? uh, so every once in a while I'm gonna smile. interrupt with the stupid cough. No See if I can take something there. So, you know, hi, right, I have a question for you, Hannah. Yeah. You have a boyfriend yet? Uh, no, I don't. Good. Now I told you. And I said it in the last podcast, for those who watched it, you are the single millionaire chick. Yeah. This is what you need to do. You need to do a YouTube show, right, of you traveling around and having dates with guys, and the guys should woo you to prove that they're worthy of marrying or even dating someone as cool as you and as rich as you. Yeah. No, and trust me, I, I got my standards now. I got my list of my deal breakers and what I want in a gentleman. <laughs> oh, really? I, I, wait, wait. All right. We got to go into that list. What's the top of the list? Top of the list, I, I would say self-sufficient, right? I, I, I don't want to be no sugar mama out here. I, I need somebody who's on my same level and my same wavelength and going in the direction of our goals, Right. I mean, you you meet so many people, especially like my generation, the Gen Z generation. I mean, people are still out there partying, going out every single weekend. I mean, honestly, why I moved into this new condo here is because I got a really crap and cool view because I sometimes don't even leave my house within like 72 hours because <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'm just working and doing things around the house and hanging out with my kitty cats. <laughs> uh, don't don't end up one of those you know old cat ladies. <laughs> I might be one though. <laughs> I know that's why I said I don't want you to end up one of those old cat ladies. That's that would be bad. No, you you are way too talented to be an old cat lady. Uh, hey, and, and actually speaking of, um, next week I'm gonna be hopping in the van and I'm gonna be going out to uh the West Coast. So I have a lot of events. I'll be speaking on stages. And um, I got a few podcast shows out there, but I, I got to go to San Diego. I got to be in Tucson, Arizona, Vegas. And so instead of going back and forth from the West to the East Coast, I said, well, Daisy, let's load you up. Let's get into the van and let's go live the nomad lifestyle for a little bit. So you have all these places you go going to speak and you don't invite me to speak with you? You can come hang out. Well, tell all these people that you'll only go on their stage if, you let, if they let me on their stage too. I know. And I do actually, I do reference your book a lot. So for my listeners, you, you got to go and read Larry's book, um, uh, Money Hacks, because everything you know about money is wrong. That's right. It's wrong. <laughs> it's terrible that it's wrong, but it's wrong. And this is the book right here. I actually put it up on the screen. Oh, good. No, it's a good book. I really like your writing style in there. Well, thank you very much. And that's a, there's a chapter in there all about what? The Infinite Banking Concept, Chapter 13. All right, everyone. So we're back. I'm here with Larry. So we had a recording session not too long ago. And uh, you, as y'all know, I moved into my new condo. And actually, later that day, I had my Spectrum guy come over and had to fix all my internet issues. But now I'm on the road. I'm in the van. I'm actually visiting grandma and grandpa right now. So and Larry's feeling a lot better here today. But uh, thanks for joining me again today. Hey, for you anytime. Awesome. And I'll be seeing you sometime soon, I think, right? I think we got some events coming up. Well, we got something coming up. We got uh, February 10th. We got 
you know, the, the event we sponsored for you guys, the Money Multiplier. I don't think you're coming now. I think Jonah's coming. Jonah will be there. Yeah. I'm coming up to Philly, though, uh, April 20th for Ken's event. Oh, good. Yeah, so it'll be a good time. Cool. So the impact event. That's great. But, um, but hey, man, so I, I guess really the topics I want to talk about, and we'll get into them here in a little bit, because I want to explore more about your background. Okay. But um, I want to talk about HELOC loans and the rates of where they're going at okay. in 2024. And then also, let's get into a little bit of sub two and that subject two of sure. as kind of the big rave of what's happening here yeah. recently. A lot more folks are talking about it. Um. But I want you to explain to the audience, can you maybe share a story of how it went when you purchased your first investment property? And I think you were 18 years old when that happened. All right. So it all starts like this. So I'm working for a company called Crazy Eddie. One or two people watching this go, Crazy Eddie, I remember that. Wow. It's been a long time. You're going, what the hell is Crazy Eddie? But I I get it, you know, because, you know. You know, you got to be old like me and you got to be from Brooklyn like me to understand who Crazy Eddie was. So I'm working there and I was an electronics technician. I used to fix the VCRs and the TVs. You know what a VCR is? I'll bet you don't even know what that is. Forget it. <laughs> so we used to fix the VCRs and the TVs and the car stereos. And it was a lot of fun. And and I was 18 years old. I started there 18, 19 years old when I, you know, when I'm working there. But I'm 18 at the time. And one of the head technicians is talking to me about how he's buying properties He's like, you know, maybe 30 years old, whatever, 35 years old. And he's talking about how he's buying properties in a short town called Belmar. And he's renting them out. He's making lots of money. So he buys them. He renovates them. And he rents them out. I'm like, wow, that's great. Well, you know, Hannah, how old are you now? I'm 24. I'll be 25 this year. Okay. So you remember not too long ago when you were 18. Uh right? And you noticed that from like the time you were 18 to 24, you know a lot less. Yeah. You used to know everything at 18. Oh, yeah. Yeah, wait till you hit my age and realize how little you really know. So when <laughs> I was 18, just like you were and just like everybody watching this, when you're 18 years old, you know everything. So I mm-hmm. said, well, if this guy could do it, I'm 18. I know everything. I can do it, too. So the funny part was I decided I wanted to do it, but I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. And one day I'm at the gym. And, you know, at the gym, at the gym that I went to, you know, they had these the, the stationary bikes. I'm at the stationary bike. And the reason my head is cut off right now, you can't see my body, is because you could tell I haven't been to the gym in a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you're, you know, you got to be working with Gordon. Aren't you working with yeah, Gordon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole other story. I'm like the <laughs> Match.com pictures. You, know, you, you See, if you go to Match.com, if anybody single goes to Match.com and you only see a picture from here up, you know they're fat. No, 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 no. Or what people are doing now is like people my age that uh, are in college or past college age, they'll have all of their pictures of when they were in high school, right? Oh, yeah, they'll yeah. have all their yeah. pictures. And then yeah. the very last yeah. picture is what they actually look like right now. Right. Well, that's even, <laughs> but but still just understand, it's really funny. Like everybody who's ever been to Match.com knows what I'm talking about. If you go from yeah. here up and that's all you see, you know they're fat. Just, <laughs> and, and I'm only telling you that because that's what I did. I set the camera up so you can't see I'm fat. So, so, um, so anyway, so I'm at the gym. <laughs> Boy, did we go off on a, on a rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so I'm at the gym. And, you know, at the gym now, if you go to the gym now and you want to entertain yourself, they have TVs at the gym. But most of the time you have your cell phone and your iPad, you know, and you have all this stuff that you can do. But there used to be these things called books. I don't know if you've ever seen a book before. No one reads those anymore. I know. They always read it on their iPad or iPhone, right? Or so, the Kindle. I, I know, right? I mean, you know, like, you know, here, shameless plug of my book, of course, is if you want to, you can actually get this book also on on uh, on Kindle, and you can get it, and you can read it. It's a shameless plug. And you can get this book. It's a great book. It's actually in book form. You can actually buy it in book form. Isn't that amazing? That is I mean, good. I mean, I hand them out. People go like, what's this? It's got paper. <laughs> so anyway, I'm, I'm there, and there's, you know, I have no, I didn't bring my book. So I go to the front of the room, and I'm looking for something to read. And it used to be these things called the real estate book. Wait, am I like, all I'm doing is going down memory lane here, this entire interview. So <laughs> they used to do these things called the real estate book. And all the real estate agents put their listings in a real estate book because there was no MLS, there was no Zillow, there was no, you know, whatever. So mm-hmm. all those things were in a real estate book. So I'm in a place called Princeton, New Jersey. And in Princeton, New Jersey, I'm looking at this book and I come across this 
I don't know, two family house that's listed for twenty six thousand five hundred dollars in a town called Easton, Pennsylvania. And I'm eighteen years old, and I'm looking at this house. I'm like, ah, maybe I'll call a real estate agent and find out what the story is. So I call a real estate agent. It turns out Easton, Pennsylvania is an hour and a half from where I was, but I take the drive and I go to see it. So she shows it to me, and you know, I look at it. And she goes, "What do you think?" I go, "I'll take it." I I didn't even negotiate because I didn't even know you <laughs> could negotiate. Because when yeah. I was 18 years old, I knew everything. And I knew that you didn't know how to negotiate, whatever. So I go to negotiate. I didn't even negotiate it. I'm like, I'll take it. She goes, well, I need a $500 deposit. I'm like, I don't have $500. And she goes, well, do you have $100? I said, I guess. So I write her a $100 check. But the reality was I didn't even have $100 to write her a check. Yeah. Well, I, figured I, I figured out how to make that check clear. And about a month later, I close in this property. And sure enough, I'm getting rental income. You know, I'm fixing the property up. I'm also getting rental income. And I make the biggest mistake ever, which is I sell that property a year later for a 50% profit. Hmm. Now, 50% profit is pretty damn good, especially a year later. But yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, if I would have held on to that property, it would be incredible. It would be worth about $350,000 right now. It would have uh, incredible passive income. And I could have gotten rich off that. Just the one property I could have gotten rich off because I could have used that to leverage other properties, leverage other properties, leverage other properties. So that was my that was my very first property when, when I was 18 years old. And, of course, I kept buying properties through that time and eventually hit this little snag called um, greed. Mm -hmm. You guys, you know what greed is, right? Yeah. Now Everyone will, gets into you that. Will. You will. Yeah. You will because yeah. everybody makes a greedy mistake, and I made some greedy mistakes. So I was yeah. buying properties. I was buying all profitable properties. I was doing everything great until around 2006. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm doing this for years. And these people, like Hannah, they wake up one day and they buy a property for $100,000. And the next day it's worth one hundred and fifty. I must mm -hmm. be doing something wrong. So my great strategy that I had before, which was buy properties that were good prices, rent them, make sure that the rent pays the mortgage, and be able to, you know, be able to have great properties, I decided to change my my strategy to something I call the stupid and greedy strategy. <laughs> and here's the stupid and and greedy strategy. You buy properties that are overpriced. You don't get enough rent to pay the mortgages. And eventually you do what exactly happened to me was you run out of money and you go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. so in 2008, the crash of 2008, I had $3.9 million worth of properties and I owed about $3 million, which isn't bad. You know, you figure you got, you got 75% equity and three million three, and $4 million worth of property. It's great. Except overnight, it seemed like those properties went from 3.9 to 1.2. Mm -hmm. And when the trustee finally sold them all, they were worth about $750,000. So that's what happened to me. But I actually, since then, that's why I wrote my book and I started to learn about money. Now, I knew about money before, but I really started to learn about money, like to protect myself. Like, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, it'll never happen again. But if I ever went bankrupt for any reason, they can't take anything of mine anymore which is yeah. really, really cool. In fact, I always joke and say, well, I am 60. I always joke and say that if I had to go into a nursing home, I qualify for Medicaid. I'm yeah. worth millions and millions of dollars and have dozens and dozens and dozens of properties, but I qualify for Medicaid and I don't have to sell anything. So my mm -hmm. wife or my kids can get all my stuff without, without me having to sacrifice anything because of what I learned from the bankruptcy. And it's pretty amazing. And by the way, it's funny because one of the techniques is actually... <gasps> Whole life insurance. Whole insurance. <laughs> Whole life insurance is one of the, it's, it's amazing what a great tool it is. Uh, it's yeah. so funny because people come to me all the time because they, they hear me talk about it on the radio. Like, because I have a radio show for you guys who don't know. I do a radio show every Saturday. I talk about all these topics. And every once in a while, you get a call and going, Larry, is whole life insurance a good investment? I, you know, my immediate response is, no, it sucks. Yeah. And they're like, <laughs> what? But I hear you talk about it all the time. I'm like, I know, but it's a terrible investment. But that's not what we use it for. If you're yeah. using it for an investment, go buy something else. If you're yeah. using it to learn how to leverage money and how to and how to hide money from the government or your creditors or or m multiply money, which is which is the way you teach it, it's a freaking <laughs> awesome tool. But you yeah. have to learn how to use the tool. It's funny because I had somebody in my office today. I was coaching them, and they're like, "Yeah, I heard about this thing about infinite banking, so I bought a whole life insurance policy." From my agent. I'm like, let me oh. guess. Let me guess. I was, you want to hear the funny thing? I actually said, all right, how much is the face value? Like, how much is the death benefit? And she goes, $100,000. And the second she said 100000 it didn't even matter. The second she said 100000 I said, he did it wrong. 
Yeah. She goes, how do you know? I go, because most likely, if you bought a proxy from a person who knows how to do infinite banking, it wouldn't be a round number. Yes, exactly it. Because <laughs> we're always reverse engineering it. I know. Right, it wouldn't be a round number. It'd be like maybe $107,411.62 would be the death benefit, you know? <laughs> that's because right, it just, that's just right. you know, that's what, that, that's what it works out because if you're doing the numbers right. And I'm like, let yeah. me tell you something. That guy, when you called him up to buy the whole life insurance policy after you went to some seminar and didn't understand it, and that guy went, oh, how exciting. I'm going to make $5,000 off this woman because she doesn't know anything about anything. And yep. sure enough, you know, so now I had to set her straight. I told her she actually, she's going to be coming and Jonah will be telling her how to, she'll be coming to the Money Multiplier event that we have coming up and Jonah will be telling her how to do it right. I told her to come and I said, and then I said, how old is the policy? And she goes, oh, it's about three months old. And I go, good. Now we, good. we didn't waste a lot of money making a mistake. We could fix it. Yeah. Yeah. But I just hey, went hey, over hey, a whole lot of stuff, didn't I? And actually, actually, for the audience, too, if anybody does have like an enforced policy, go out there and obtain an enforced illustration and just send it over to us. Send it to my email, Hannah. Hannah spelled the same way, forwards and backwards, Hannah at the money And I'll give you my feedback on it. That's what I do all day long. Folks are sending me their IUL policies. Oh, my gosh. Before I even get into that, oh, let me tell you about a conversation I just had yesterday. There is a gentleman who I met him through a community. I was doing webinars for him. And he says, hey, you know, I went down and I was talking to my life insurance friend and I was explaining him uh, about the infinite banking concept. And he set me up with a policy. And I said, okay, well, is it a whole life policy? And he goes, yeah. And he get and I asked him, well, does it have cash value? Can you access it immediately? And he says, no, I got to wait about a year to access it. Um, and I said, okay, well, th that's a little odd because normally if it's designed properly and you're working with a mutually owned company, you're able to access that cash immediately and my definition of that is within 30 days and, and he says okay well let me go and look at this thing and i'll send it over to you uh, um it says that it's in universal index life and i was like oh man no that that's not what you want they're they're apples and oranges right there so anyways if you're getting into this concept and i've been preaching this all day long on my podcast show you know work with somebody who practices what they preach and who are authorized ibc practitioners but um but anyways that, that's not why we're here uh talking with larry today because larry's my real estate expert but you know no no i'm more than real estate please don't call me a real estate expert uh, i'm true. a money expert right like and, money and, and expert. the reason the only reason i want to verify that right now is because i don't care i'm not licensed to sell life insurance i don't care when you come to see my people that you know when i have you speak at my events the reason i have you speak at my events and your family is because i trust you guys i understand what you're doing now and i'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent with iul for a second because i i want people to understand that right now iul looks fantastic yeah, it looks like the greatest thing since life. But oh, my IUO is kicking ass, is kicking head, is Kessler's policy ass. Yep. Yeah, it is. But when you borrow against it, and when the market goes down, like in the same quarter, yeah, all of a sudden you're going to get a phone call from your agent going, Hey, we need ten thousand dollars to keep your policy alive, or your policy lapses. And by the way, all that money you took tax free, you now have to pay taxes on. Yes, that's the problem. The problem isn't that it's like, it's not, you can't do the same concept. You can, but the yeah. risk is the problem. The risk, if you got that policy created incorrectly, and first of all, any policy that's out there that's correct, that's created incorrectly is a nightmare. But if yeah. you use an IB, I'm sorry, a, a, a IUL policy and it's done incorrectly, oh, the, the, the nightmare comes later when you borrow the money. Now, I'm going to tell you something interesting. I have mm -hmm. what it used to be called universal uh, universal variable life, yeah. which is, that was the predecessor to this. And I bought that policy 30 years ago. Yeah. Now I happen to have one and I happen to see the numbers move up and down constantly. It yeah. just happens to be a very old policy. By the way, my policy is better than their policy because my policy, the life insurance portion isn't as expensive as the new one. But yes. the other thing that they do is they hide the life insurance portion in there and they make the life insurance portion very expensive. So it's not it's, that's not that's not a good thing anyway. But the real problem is when you go to borrow the money, what might happen is the policy might implode. And yeah. and look, I'm I, I have no you know, when Hannah Skin calls in the you game. Up, yeah, when Hannah calls you up and goes, eh, let me tell you why it's better, she's 
going to blast you. When I tell you, I'm telling you, I've done the research. I understand it. I have one, an old one, and I know the difference. So please understand that IUL is good, and the policies with a mutual life policy is the best to do it with, with uh, to do infinite banking. So yeah. I just wanted to get that straight because I teach money. I teach a lot of real estate because I love real estate. I teach a lot of stock market because I love the stock market. I love infinite banking policies because it's a great way to make money. I mean, not make money, but hide money. And we, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm like, it's funny because like Hannah and even her dad, the two of them will talk about the, the stuff that they talk about, like how to pay off debt with it. Mm -hmm. And I'll sit there and I'll come up with some really cool ideas of how to keep yourself from having the government take all your money by using the whole life insurance policy. Yeah, yeah. And protecting yourself. Hey, you yeah. should plug your uh, radio show. How can My people find that? Show. Yeah, so every, it's supposed to be every two o'clock, but every once in a while it's 10 o'clock. On Saturdays, I do a radio show on WPHT, and it's 1210 AM, 1210 AM WPHT in Philadelphia. Now, obviously, if you're watching this, you're not in Philadelphia, you can just go to 1210 Radio. I think it's 1210radio.com or something like that, or just look it up, 1210 Radio, and you can listen to the show. Or if you connect to me on Facebook, uh, you can actually go to contactlarry.com. That's contactlarry.com, and you'll get all my links. And you connect to me on Facebook, you can actually watch the show on Facebook too. And it's a lot of fun. We have a blast with that show. It's like it's like um, Howard Stern meets the financial universe. <laughs> hey, since you brought up that gentleman, let me tell you this. Um, so, you know, my younger brother, he's a pilot, Zach. He flies for NetJet. Zach actually just flew Howard Stern. Oh, it was right. him, his wife, and I think they had like six bunny rabbits on board. Oh, that's hysterical. <laughs> that's really funny. That's cool. Wow. So since you brought him up. That's awesome. But but hey, okay, so so that was your first ever deal. Um now fast forward to where we're at right now. You've been doing real estate transactions for what, forty plus years now, would you say? Forty two years. Forty two years. 42 total, years. Right? Yeah, yeah. And so because you've been doing it for so long, you have found strategies where you don't have to put maybe any money down or if right. so, very, very little. Right. Talk about that. So, I mean, I'll give you a great example. I just bought a mobile home park literally yesterday. We cool. actually closed. Like, it kind of, thank you. It was kind of cool. It was kind of fun. It was like we've been trying to do this for a while. So I bought this mobile home park. It's going to cash flow probably between thirty five hundred and four thousand dollars a month. That's positive cash flow after all bills are paid, which is phenomenal. Wow. And I went to I went to contract, and it's funny because I went to contract with like I always do with absolutely no money. I don't put any money down. There's no such to me. There's no such thing as earnest money deposit. And the funny part was like about a month after the we went to contract, the seller called me up and said, "Hey, uh, did you send a deposit?" I go, "What deposit?" And she goes, "Aren't you supposed to send a deposit? Isn't that how things work?" I go, "Well, no, my contract says zero deposit." And she was like, "Oh." You got all nervous. They go, don't worry, we're buying it. Relax, it's fine. But she was all nervous because she didn't like she never saw that before, you know, because she's yeah. been to just doing traditional real estate. Anyway, I go to closing the other day with no money. We entered a closing, no, absolutely no money. And we leave with a check for almost sixteen thousand hmm. dollars. So I bought the park with absolutely no money in my pocket, created sixteen thousand dollars of closing, and then we'll get about thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars a month positive cash flow out of this property. So, like, oh. the question I have for everybody, and you can answer it for them, how many of those deals do you want to do? All of them. Right, exactly. All them. of them. Right, right. Yeah. So, I do that constantly. You know, I mean, I can tell you story after story after story. Another one was, so, you know, your dad collects airplanes, which is pretty amazing. I collect <laughs> cars. Yeah. You know, my cars are probably, probably cost what the propeller costs on your on your dad's airplane. <laughs> All I know is I should be a real estate, I should be an insurance agent and stop doing this crap of teaching people how to get rich. I can get rich <laughs> selling life insurance. Not even. <laughs> <laughs> so I collect cars. I got about yeah, about eight kind of collector cars. I have a Model T. I have a beautiful Model T. It looks like it's brand new. It looks like it came right out of the showroom. I have an MGB. I have Mustangs. Yeah, whatever. Uh, Thunderbird. Whatever. And, anyway, so Jaguars. And I needed a place to put these cars. And because like my my garage at home is a two car garage, I mean there's no place to put these cars, and one car and if you, and if anybody knows you know we're men, not like you Hannah but we're men, and everybody knows that a man if he has a two car garage is really a one car garage. Because the other one 
clips together pal? full of junk. Oh, full of junk. Yeah, okay. full of junk, like tools and crap. So it's really a one car garage, right? Yeah, it's yeah, funny. Yeah. My wife's my wife's my wife's uh, classic Mustang is in there right now. That I but I, there's only thing in there. Because her side has the classic Mustang. My my side has all the junk. The other cars are at the at the warehouse we're, we're talking about. So yeah. I'm looking for this warehouse. And first of all, if you want to store cars in a storage place, it's between two hundred fifty and three hundred bucks a month. So I figure three hundred bucks a month. Figure just a half a dozen cars, make it easy. Eighteen hundred bucks, right? That that's that's a lot of money, right? So I decided I was gonna look for a warehouse. So I find this warehouse that has two sides to it. One side's rented out, and the back is empty. So I can put my cars in the back and I rent out the front. I took it with the tenant. I find a guy, we negotiate a price, <coughs> and he says, Great. So sure enough, I sign it. How much money did I put down? Nada. Nothing, right? Nothing. Yeah. I go to closing, right? And I go with how much money? Zero. Done. And I leave with a check with $13,788. And I get about, yeah, probably about $300 positive cash flow out of the front total. And I have a place to put my cars for free. Wow. So this is the way so, I do business. So, and how are you doing all that? How are hey, you walking I'm, into those deals? I'm just smart. <laughs> You don't want to share. Well, I'll share a little bit. You know, I mean, you know, you see that you see that QR code over there. Yes, if you if you class. if you haven't clicked that QR code over there yet, you're watching this webinar and you're intrigued. Click the freaking QR code and sign up for my class, will you? By the way, the first class is free anyway. You can come any Thursday night for free at seven o'clock online or in person, and I will teach you something. Maybe you know, maybe it's just basically I don't know. Maybe it's how uh, how to get on webinars with the single millionaire chick. <laughs> and actually, uh, Larry is located uh, right outside Philadelphia in Langhorne, Pennsylvania. So anybody right. in uh, those neck of the woods, you go see him. Bucks County. Yep. All right. So, yeah. So there's different ways to do that. So both of these deals, actually, both of those two deals, I mean, it depends. It just, it just happens to both of them. Both of them, actually, both of them are similarly structured, which is interesting, where the seller actually held back part of the part of the um, part of the you know the purchase price where like for the for example the mobile home park the woman who sold it to me and it's funny because the woman actually called me up because she's known me for a while and she needed to sell this and she knew that i would be a quick closing so she called me up and she said i'll hold back half the price so she she held back half whatever the purchase price was she held back half and i make payments to her so now all i had to do was come up with the other half so what i did was let's say i needed half a million all I did was I asked somebody for 550000 instead of a half a million. So I borrowed more than I needed, and I leave closing with money. Now you're looking at – now somebody will like, oh, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to owe more money on the property? Who cares? The cash. Remember I told you the property's cash flowing $3,500 to $4,000 a month. Who cares yeah. how much I borrowed? Does it matter who's paying it? The tenants. Yeah. I don't pay that money The tenants. And you want to know mm -hmm. one of the greatest places I get money from? Your life insurance policy. I get from my life insurance policy, but I get from other people's life insurance policies. Yeah. That's really cool. Where, like, I call up Hannah, and she's got $7 million in her life insurance policy. <laughs> I go, Hannah, can you lend me $6.8 million? And she goes, sure. And I charge you. Yeah, you charge me a great interest because you're paying you're paying 5% interest on it, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the wild part. You're paying uh, – I'm going to go into selling freaking your policy shit again. Uh, <laughs> you're getting 5% interest on it. I'm sorry. You're paying 5% interest on it. You're getting 4% interest on it. You're technically – you're actually netting one, but you're actually netting a lot. It's actually costing you a lot More. less than 1%. A lot yeah. less than 1% because the math, but – one day I have to, you know, I have to show that math to people, and they're like, "Huh, you're right. It is a lot. Is this one, one big difference?" But even if you're, even if you're paying five and you're not getting the four, that's really more than four. If you're not getting the four, you're charging me eight or ten. Yep. And it's free freaking money to you. Yeah. And it's backed by a piece of real estate. So one of the questions that people have all the time is like, "How do you get people to lend me money? Like, how do you get people to lend you money?" Right. Yeah. If the deal is a good deal, the money will find you. You'll have people throwing money at you. And yes. it's fantastic. So all you need is a good deal, a deal that shows to the person that you're lending you money that they can't lose money. That's mm -hmm. what's important. Yeah. All day long. The collateral. Absolutely. And you're all and you always take the first position. I say that all the time. Take the first position. You're, you're right. You're not and first I, or last. 
first first is definitely the right position, but sometimes you can't. So because sometimes there's another mortgage on it, or sometimes there's a reason you can't. But if you can't, just make sure it makes sense to take the second position. I mean, look, if you have, and here's a, here's a great example. Let's say you have a property worth a half a million dollars, and there's a first position mortgage of two hundred thousand, and somebody's asking you for one hundred and fifty, and you have to go into second. So what? So the yeah. first position is two hundred. Yours is is one fifty. There's still one hundred and fifty thousand dollars equity in the house. Mm-hmm. So it's okay to do a second position. Just be, just understand what that means. You know, yeah. it means that the first guy gets his money first. Mm-hmm. So if the property value goes down to two fifty, he gets his two two fifty or before you get anything, before you get anything. So, but just understand that and understand that risk. If you understand that risk, it's fine. I mean, I actually have somebody who borrowed money recently on a fourth position, like and lent money on a fourth position. I'm like, holy shit! But the numbers were they weren't great. You know what I mean? Okay. So it was kind of like. She did the person a favor yeah. and, you know, mitigated the risk a little bit. So, you know, the risk to her was probably maybe 20% of her money was what I mm-hmm. figured the risk was. But she's mm-hmm. like, this is a really nice person. I want to help them. I'm like, okay, great. But this is the risk. And she's like, I, I don't think there'll be a problem. And I actually know the person too. And I'm like, I agree. I don't think it's going to be a risk because the person is the right person. But understand, mm-hmm. never underwrite a deal based on a person because you never know. Out of emotion, based on a deal, right? Based on a deal. So yeah. she she was willing. To, the lender was willing to take the about twenty percent risk of her money. So it wasn't so bad, but still, that's a fourth position. That's very unusual. I mean, if you're yeah. if you're a fourth position, fourth position, you're you know you're just risking it. Yeah, no, I hear that. Now, talk to me about this. We're at the start of twenty twenty four. There, there is a lot of talk about how we're moving into like the renter world and everybody's renting nowadays because big corporations are coming in, buying out the land, buying out the houses. So um, I, I don't know. I, I guess before I even ask you my next question, do you have thoughts on where we're headed in 2024? And especially because it's an election year, Larry. I know. My, my buddy's going to be president again. I can't wait. <laughs> So, so I, I mean, where do you see us going moving forward? Do you think us, the common people, still have the authority and freedom to be buying up all these the investment properties like how we did before or times kind of change in? Did you put yourself in the category of a common person? I don't know. Just uh, us as a community. No, all no, us. No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 That's wrong? No. If you're watching this, you are not a common person. That's and if you true. want to be a common person, turn it off. Go watch TV. Go watch. Yeah. I don't know. what I don't even know what shows are on TV anymore because I don't watch TV. Go watch yeah. some stupid TV show because that's a common person. An uncommon person or somebody who doesn't want to live in mediocrity doesn't live in mediocrity. So the common person who, you know, who's renting because they can't afford to buy a house because they don't know how. Mm-hmm. You want to know how you want to know how how much I care? I don't. Zero. Yeah. I don't. I mean, look, you know, I feel bad that there are people out there that don't want to learn, but that's their problem. So if you're yeah. watching this and you've never seen, and you've never learned how to buy houses with no money, or never learned how to buy your own house, or think that, oh my god, my credit score is only five hundred and I have ten cents in my name, I can't buy a house. Bullshit. I could teach you how to do it. Yeah. So be uncommon. Be you. Be not mediocre. And if yeah. you stop being mediocre and you stop thinking you're mediocre, because that's why I want to make sure you don't call yourself common, Hannah, because you were yeah. so uncommon that to call yourself common would just bring you down. And right? I guess I'm kind of speaking at the level of, you know, because where I'm at, my Gen Z generation is a lot of people, you know, you see on Twitter, on Facebook, you know, they're griping about um, they, they just can't afford anything anymore. Hey, I can't afford Aww. to do houses. And I, and I, I think you hit the nail right on the head. you got to be open to learning the yeah. possibilities that are out there and expanding your knowledge base to be able to do so. So I, I appreciate that message. Yeah, I got on the phone with somebody who recently who like she's been literally being evicted Mm -hmm. and you know and and somebody i know it's not somebody's not a friend but somebody i know and she's being evicted and she's like what do i do how do i make money i'm like i don't know do you have a job no i said we'll go get one well i don't want a job (laughs) then i won't be able to do real estate and i'm thinking that is the dumbest freaking statement i've ever heard (laughs) and i said go get a job and she goes well what can i do i'll make 15 dollars an hour i go how much are you making now 
And she goes, zero. I go, this is $15 an hour more than you're making now. <laughs> get up and go. Right, get up and go. Do something. Oh, well, I want to be a real estate investor. How long have you want to be a real estate investor? For three years. So you quit your job three years ago. How many pieces of real estate did you buy? Well, none. Then you're not a real estate investor. You were yeah. a broke, almost, almost homeless person. Stop mm -hmm. being a broke, homeless person and start doing something else to at least make it so that you could do real estate. People yeah. get the expression, follow your passion and the money will come. Mm -hmm. It's fucking bullshit. <laughs> okay? Here's the reality. Go work for a living so you can afford your passion. Mm -hmm. I like that. You're working for a living and you can afford your passion, then things will might start to happen for you. Yeah. Right? If your passion is buying real estate, great, that might happen. But what if your passion is scuba diving? How many people go into you know scuba diving, find a sunken ship, and find the balloons? <laughs> Not a lot. Not gonna happen, right? <laughs> so, so you got to work to follow your pet to pay to feed your passion of, of scuba diving. You got to buy the gear, you got to buy the thing, you got to get boats out, you got to go on vacations. That's scuba diving. That's the passion of scuba diving. It's no different. Real estate wow. is no different. The passion of owning real estate and owning passive rental income, it doesn't happen overnight. You're not going to yeah. go, oh, I'm going to buy a property tomorrow. I have no properties. I'm going to buy a property. I'm going to make $20,000 a month in this property. Yeah. That, nope. and, uh, yeah. Yeah. Go back to sleep because you're dreaming. Well, it's a, it's a Warren Buffett quote. You can't have un, unrealistic uh, returns or un, unrealistic expectations for these unrealistic returns. Yeah. Somewhere, somewhere uh, along those lines. I, I mean, I teach stock options. It's funny because... I've had people, you know, it's like a couple of years in a row, I made two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars trading stock options, just that alone. And mm -hmm. people are like, "Wow, oh, I want to do that too." And, and they're like, "Do you think I could do that with five thousand dollars?" No, no. I was like, "No, you can't do it with five thousand dollars." And they're like, mm -hmm. "Well, what do you think I can make on five thousand dollars?" I go, "Well, let me ask you a question. If you turned your five thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars in one year, would that yeah. would that make you happy?" Well, no. I said, dude, that's a hundred percent return. What's wrong with you? The odds yeah. of you making a hundred percent return a year is slim to none. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can get lucky and you might do it once or twice, but it's not going to happen. If you yeah. turn your twenty five five thousand to it's a seventy five hundred, that's an incredible return. These people just don't get it. So yeah. sometimes you got to you got to bring it back to earth. Yeah, you just got to be real with them. And actually, that's why I respect you as a mentor because you are. You're very. Um, hey, I might say some things that you don't like, but I I'm saying it out of tough love and you need oh, to yeah. hear it. I'm a tough love guy. <laughs> so I tell people, get a job. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, 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 what about um because you know, rates right now, you know how the Fed is supposed to announce their rates and yep. some change is happening. What, what do you see about uh, HELOCs? And for, for the public, and I do believe that y'all, if you've been following us, because you're not the common person. That's right. But um, a, a HELOC, right? Home equity line of credit. Right. What you're doing is you're leveraging the equity inside of your house and being able to put that lazy money to work is what yeah. I always say. I like it. So wh where do you say um, the HELOC uh, rates go in in 2024? Yeah, so, so let's just talk about rates in general. So yeah. rates hit this point where they they were like 3%, right? That mm -hmm. was just, again, unrealistic. It was one of those moments in history where we hit the most incredible low rates. And artificial. Lucky, it doesn't matter. I don't mm -hmm. care if it's artificial or, or, or real. It doesn't really matter. What happened is it happened. Mm -hmm. So if you locked in a mortgage at 3 or 3.5%, wow, that's freaking phenomenal. It's just phenomenal. It's probably not going to happen again for a long time. Yeah. Where rates normally should be is between five and seven percent. Mm -hmm. Where are rates now, Hannah? They're go. They're between going five up. and seven percent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just it's normal, you know. Yeah. You, the credit card companies are taking advantage of people now with the thirty percent rates. I mean, those should be sixteen, seventeen percent, maybe twenty, but they shouldn't be thirty. And now they're trying to push legislation to make them over thirty. I mean, look, yeah. you know, they're just taking advantage, and that's just the way it is. They take advantage of people and people get stuck in the cycle and they keep going. That's why you need an infinite banking policy to hide your money. So when you don't pay your credit cards, they can't get it from you. Ha ha ha. Anyway, another story. <laughs> if you ever want to, if you guys ever want to learn how to do that, either talk to Hannah or talk, talk to me. I'll tell you how to, I don't even know if you guys teach hiding your money in whole life, but 
It's the greatest place to hide money. It's amazing. It's and better. I, it, it that an IRA, two greatest places you can hide money. But the life insurance is more protected than the IRA. Yeah, yeah. Well, not in limitations. That's the thing with the IRA. That that's right. just my biggest beef that's with right. the IRA is just the limitations of how much I can put into it. No, no. Because no, if I'm going to be the hide. single million, that's right. true. But right. if I'm going to be the single millionaire chick, I need to be putting my money somewhere. I, that yeah. cash flow is be flowing through somewhere, and I can't be limited. That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, hey, are you using uh, HELOCs right now on some of your yeah, investments I, that you're have, doing or maybe I, rehabs? I, I get HELOCs all the time. HELOCs are my favorite loan. Now, you're going to pay probably sometimes 2% more, two points more than you will in a traditional mortgage. But here's the thing about HELOC. HELOC is you could pay it off mm -hmm. and it's still open so you can access it again. It's a renewable resource. Mm -hmm. I love HELOC. So I can actually, so let's say, for example, you have $200,000 equity in your house. And you could access $150,000 of it, right? That money is sitting there. Like you said, it's being wasted. If your house is a half a million dollar house, for example, and it's going up 5% every year, it's going up 5% every year, no matter how much you owe on it. If you owe the whole 500000 and it goes up 5%, you just made $25,000 on zero money because you had zero equity. So you want to take as much money out of your house as you can, assuming you're going to do something smart with it. Don't go buy don't go buy couches and don't go buy cars with it because that's not the place to put it. If you're gonna if you're gonna buy investment or lend it to an investor and make money on the money, then you now made money on your money, and your house is still going up or the the equity is still going up in the house every year because of inflation, just inflation mm -hmm. alone. Now, if you take that money and you use it to to get investments or to lend to somebody, you're making money in your money, which is, so now you have another one. I always thought, and it's funny because I'm going, you do this to me every time. You make me talk about infinite banking all the time. Why do you do that to me? <laughs> you just love it. You just I love know, it. It's, 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 it's a myth that you love it. Yeah, it really is. It really is. So you got, so you know the infinite banking concept, right? So the infinite mm -hmm. banking concept, one vehicle is life insurance, but there is another vehicle that most people don't understand. It's a house. Or, or, a, or an investment property. So you could do the entire infinite banking concept with an investment property or any property you have equity in the same exact way you could do it with your life insurance policy. Mm -hmm. But your life insurance policy is just another add-on. So you could add on to this. So I actually tell people, take your HELOC, buy an infinite banking policy, call Hannah, buy the infinite banking policy, right? Put in Put the money from the HELOC into the policy, then yeah. take the money out of the policy and go buy a house. Yeah. Now you take that house, and if that has when that has equity in it, you take the money out of that house, you buy another house. And you just keep doing it. Now, if you ever want to sell one of the policies off or one of the houses off and pay back the, the policy, you can do that and then use that money and do it again. Mm -hmm. And each HELOC, as you pay those HELOCs off, are also the same exact thing. You're getting you can renew that resource and use money again. And you know, mm -hmm. it's funny because you guys, I don't. Did you guys come up with the term money multiplier, or was that something that that you uh, know what? Can... No, that was pops. That was mom and dad. I remember. I, I wasn't there, but I remember hearing the story. They were in the back of a cab one time. I, I want to say that they were in Hawaii, and they were following around dad's old mentor. And uh, they were trying to think of a name for the business, and uh, dad just says, "I got it, the money multiplier," and it just came about. And it, I tell you what, that is the perfect description for what you guys do. Perfect description. It really is. Yeah. Well, and, and people even love it. I was down at the bank not too long ago and I was open up, opening up like a account for my trust. And uh, I gave the lady my email address. She goes, the money multiplier. What's that all about? Yeah, right. It's awesome. <laughs> I know, really. So, hey, hey, you know what, though? Mm -hmm. Um. I, I didn't know if I wanted to have this conversation live with everybody or maybe we'll have it offline. I'll just tell you, I'll just tell you now. If, so yeah, tell start. me now. Go ahead and so, so, you know, I just bought my condo in right. Daytona Beach Shores. Mm -hmm. I have my other house in Daytona Beach. Wait, wait, slow down. You own two houses, correct? I own two houses. How old are you? I'm 24. Okay. All you Gen Z idiots, <laughs> stop doing what you're doing and talk to Hannah. Because she That's does right. something you don't. Okay. That's it. So so I have my other house and 
I don't know. I'm on the cusp of, do I sell it? Do I keep it? Do I create some rental income with it? I, I just don't know what to do because I'll be real. I'm busy. I don't want to manage people. I don't want to manage the properties. I, I'm, I'm running my business full time. And I, I was thinking about selling it. But here recently, I'm thinking, well, hey, you know, I, I believe the home value is going to keep going up and up. Do I keep it's this not, thing? or It's not going to keep going up. It's, it's going to go down a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's going to stay steady for a little bit. And then eventually it's going to go back up. Yeah. Now, here's two Sell things. it. No. no. Sell it to me. I'll buy it tomorrow. Okay. But okay. you should keep it. Think so? Right. <laughs> so you're 24. I'm 60. You have two houses. I have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens. Yeah. You know something I don't. Then do what you want to do. Yeah. So you you're know, so you're you thinking. Know when you should sell a you want to know when you should sell a house? When? Never. Never. I knew it. I knew you were gonna say Never. it. <laughs> Never. Did I tell yeah. you the story about how it was when I was eighteen years old? I bought a house for twenty twenty six thousand dollars. You regretted it. And a wow. year later, I sold it for a fifty percent profit, and I thought, and it was the dumbest thing I ever did in real estate. Yeah, never do it again. Well, I know, and that's what got me thinking about it not too long ago. So I, I tune into your stuff, Larry. I, I hear you on your radio yeah. shows. And I follow you around. Yeah. Right now, you're the single yeah. millionaire chick. By the way, for you guys who don't know, so I call Hannah the single millionaire chick. She gets, she drives around in this van, which, by the way, is nicer than most people's houses. <laughs> right, so she has two houses, and she has a van that's nicer than most people's houses, and she drives around this van from place to place, and it's really, really cute. And it's exciting, and she drives around with a cat, she's a twenty-four-year-old <laughs> cat lady, which is kind of funny. But she's a millionaire, and she's cute. Look at her. Look at that face. Look how cute that face is. I mean, look at that. Right? Come on. <laughs> so now you got all these guys out there going, "Wait, she's gorgeous. She's a millionaire. What the hell? I should go try to date her." So yeah. I keep thinking we should come up with a show called The Single Millionaire Chick, and you should go from town to town dating guys, and we should put that on video, you know, like the video of the date. Uh, you know, after, you, after the date, we don't want the video anymore because that's a different kind of video. But oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a video of the date, and the guys try to woo you into convincing you that they should be your boyfriend. I think yeah. it'll be the most incredible show ever. I think it'll blow away the Kardashians. It reminds me of like the MTV days. Well, yeah, but you know, it'd be better than MTV. You know, like the uh, parental control. The um, I, I was actually watching this. It I remember um, it was on YouTube, and it, it was uh, the guy had it recorded on his uh, DVR. Like that, that's how long ago the show aired, and um, it was date my mom. So the guy had right, to go yeah. out, go on a date with his mom, and then the, uh, through the mom, he would decide, hey, do I want to date this chick or not? Oh, that's hysterical. <laughs> but no, but th 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 this would be great. I mean, look, listen, you're, you're so far advanced over anyone your age. Most people, you're more advanced than most people who die. You know, like, yeah. you know, live their whole life and die, you're more advanced than they are. So so it would be, be fascinating to do this show, to have a show like that with you. And I'd love to produce it. I think it would be fantastic. But besides <laughs> that, you know, this is the kind of stuff that you guys need to do. If you're watching this show, if you don't know who Hannah is, you need to know. And if you don't know who I am, I'm telling you right now, be Hannah. Be Hannah. <laughs> I, when I was 24, I wasn't as bright as Hannah. Now, yeah, I had, I had a couple of rental properties. I was married. I think I was uh, about to get divorced for the first time. Uh -huh. I had a couple of wow. kids. You know, whatever. Yeah. But whatever the point is, I wasn't 24, maybe a little bit later than that. But the whole point was, I, you know, if I continued to hold all the properties I ever had, and this is where we were, if I continued mm -hmm. to hold all the properties I ever had, millions, millions and millions of dollars they'd be worth now. Millions. I yeah. mean, so much money that, that you know, that it would be, it, it's it's like somebody has said, oh, well, we had, well, we won the lottery. Well, I, I won the lottery, except I sold all the properties. I sold all the seeds. Mm -hmm. You were 24? Hold on to that property. Get yeah. back to me in 15 years and call me up and say, holy crap, I can't believe what this property is worth right now. What, what do you yeah. think it's worth? So right now, I um, I believe it's around 280 Okay. You ready? Mm -hmm. 15 years from now, that property will be worth about eight or $900,000. Yeah. It's okay. Is that, is that okay with you? Yeah, it's okay with me. Yeah. 
And what did you do? Who paid for the property the whole time that you, you held on to it? The tenants. Tenants. Yeah. So why why sell it? Hey, so you have uh, managers in all of your properties, huh? No, I have managers in most of my properties. I self-manage about a dozen still. Okay. And, and there's two reasons why I do it. One is because I teach property. You know, I teach like how to be a beginner management manager. So like, like somebody like you who never managed properties before, I'll give you some really good tips. You know, okay. I, I don't want to teach you how to do 300 properties. I want to teach you how to do your own half a dozen or two or three or 10 properties, right? And um, the other reason I like to do it is I like to meet people. I like to see that I'm helping people. But it's funny because it's actually even the dozen that I'm doing that I've been doing for quite a while now, they're becoming overwhelming now because I'm getting older. And, you know, investor schooling takes a lot of time, a lot of my time. Yeah. So it's actually like like I have two. And because I have so many properties, there's always a property that's emptying. So there's always there's always like almost it's almost every month or two. Somebody's moving out. And yeah. I'm replacing I'm replacing it with somebody else. So it just so happens that, you know, that every once in a while you get within my dozen that I'm managing, I'll get two people or three people moving out right in the same cluster. I'm like, oh man, I hate I, I gotta go show one, but now I gotta go show two, now I gotta show three. So it's not so bad. It's just it's just um it's better to have them managed by somebody else. But in the beginning, you need to know how to manage them. Yeah. Because it's gonna cost you too much money to, to manage them. Yeah. I pay a lot of money out management fees every year. Okay. And I can learn that in your classes. Absolutely. Yeah. I can teach you some simple ways to make sure your tenants pay. Yeah. Hey, speaking of, I'm going to be seeing Debbie here in just a little bit. Let me talk about. Uh, when? Today? Uh, I mean, on Sunday? No. Oh. Here, here in like a few uh, weeks. We're going to be okay. out in uh, Carlsbad, California. Um, oh, great. Oh, you going to the uh, Women's uh, Secret Knock or? Yep, the, yep. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And um my main focus this year is uh notes. So so notes. I, I already do a lot of private lending. I just kind of want to expand, especially to owning more real estate myself. <coughs> you definitely need to own more real estate yourself because private lending is a great thing and you make money, yeah. but you don't have an asset. No. So the cool part about real estate is you can buy the real estate. And borrow the money from somebody else, which is why I never lend money. I only borrow money. Yeah. I borrow the money from somebody else, and their money makes me money. Mm hmm And the depreciation, too, I imagine. Do you take advantage <coughs> of that? So it's, yes. The answer is, of course, you get. <clears throat> but this is my thought. I don't care about depreciation. I don't okay. care about the tax write-offs. I don't care about any of that stuff. You know what I care about? I care about every time I open up, I open up my Excel spreadsheet and I look at my net worth and go, yeah, baby, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, yeah. so that's, and that's the philosophy you should have. You should have, and everybody else should have stop thinking how much money you make. Stop thinking, um, you know, my, I got a ta tax write off and funniest thing is a lot of people. And it happens to me all the time. Like I, I have conversations with people and like, I'm like, how many, how, let me even ask you, let's see if we can get you change your mind. How much taxes do you want to pay this year, Hannah? Zero. Uh, <laughs> that's because you're still 24. You know how much taxes I want to pay this year? How much? As much I as you can? I want to pay a half a million dollars. Wow. After and why do you say that? Watch after, you, watch. after all write-offs, after every single possible write-off I could possibly take, I want mm -hmm. to write your check to the IRS for half a million dollars. Okay. You know what that means? No. That, that means mean? I probably made between three and three and a um, half million dollars in income. In income. Yep. I'm not talking about net worth. I'm talking about in income. I probably mm -hmm. made three to three and a half million dollars if I'm writing a check to the a government for half a million dollars. Yeah. So how many times do you want to write a check to the government for half a million dollars? A whole bunch of times. We need yeah, to make it, sucks, money. It, it might suck writing it, but damn. Yeah. You know, like my account says, he goes, don't worry. You know, like every time I'm like, I, I, I had a six figure number once. So I'm like, what the hell? And he yeah. goes, he goes, what do you care? You made a whole lot of money. I'm like, yeah, you're right. I made a whole lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> now you put it that way. I should have known the answer to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Hey, hey, before I let you go, what's your uh, goals for 2024? My goals for 2024? Project? Is yeah. To put, is to follow, have a camera follow you around. I produced this show called The Single Millionaire Check. Are you talking about it? I know. We've been I'm talking down. about it for a year now. Yeah, we have been. 
All right. Well, ne next time I see you, I'll be seeing you. I'll, I'll be seeing you at some point. Oh, and for my audience too, Larry, I haven't even told you about this yet. May 9th to May 11th. The Money Multiplier Mastermind, live and in person. We're holding it in Nashville, Tennessee this year. So oh, normally we hold like, it. Now everybody's going to sound like you then. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're, we're I'll, I'll go there. I'll have the accent. How cool is that? <laughs> Do I really? Everyone asks, tells me that, that I have an accent. When I was a waitress at Cracker Barrel, people would come up to me and ask, are you from Austria? Are you from Russia? Are you from the South? I'm well, like, you no, look dog. like that. You look like that, but your <laughs> accent is clearly, uh, you know, Southern. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm from the smack dab middle of the United States, Kansas City, baby. Oh, speaking of, look at my Chiefs jersey today. Or Chiefs shirt. We're repping today. <laughs> That's awesome. So, all right. Well, thanks for joining me. Is there anything else you want to leave with the community? So, you guys want to look me up? Go find me at contactlarry.com that's contactlarry.com or scan the qr code look me up you know i have a blast i, I you know hannah's like you do hannah's like just i don't know you, you know if if i was closer i'd be your uncle yeah I'll protect i agree you. because yeah. you know no i don't know if anybody else out there protecting you but i'm protecting you <laughs> no and i appreciate you and, and uh, i you know. what what has this been going on now we, we've known each other we've been hanging around each other <clears> going on what like six years now yeah, I, well, yeah, but like the last two years is when we got to know each other, which is really cool, and More, it's kind of fun. Yeah. And, and I like, you know, look. And if you're gonna date Hannah, you got to get past her father, but then you got to get past me. You know what I'm Dad more, says? I'm more, I'm more critical. He, he <clears throat> says, "Hey, you got to show me your bank statement." I was like, "Yeah, Dad. exactly, <laughs> <clears throat> exactly, right." Well, thanks, man. You got it. I'll talk to you soon, and I'm so excited. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, anytime you want to have a conversation, we're going to do a Facebook Live. Anytime, just let me know because I have a blast talking to you. You're fun. Yeah, and you too. All right. Same here. All right, catch everyone soon. Thanks for tuning into the show. We'll see you all later. Bye.